everybody. I am here in Kalmar with Cornelius Holtoff, professor of archaeology at the Linné University. And we will be having a walk and talk mm -hmm. about archaeology and heritage futures. Yes. I've been calling it future heritage no. <laughs> in all of my emails <laughs> yes. to you, but I realized, oh, that was wrong. Mm -hmm. So, should we? Let's go. Let's go. So, you are trained in archaeology. Yes. Did you always know that you wanted to be an archaeologist? Yeah, I'm afraid I'm one of those. So You're one of those. I was 10 years old when I decided to become an archaeologist. What is Heritage Future and how does it fit in with archaeology? Right, um, that's obviously that's quite a long story, but the, um, the way we de define the term now is that it is about the relationship between present and future societies and the role that heritage plays in negotiating that relationship. And as heritage, so, what is heritage? Heritage it's is for me is what reminds us of the past. Yeah? It's like um, there's a castle over there. <laughs> Or oh, they're actually just over here. Uh, it's called Quartier uh, Edwalnoetstrel, where they did some excavations a few years ago. Uh, this is the oldest area where the old city of, of, of Kalmar um, stood. So all this is heritage. What, what, what the remains that are left, the memories we have, the uh, the traces we can find of um, different time periods, and that sort of link, great links between the past, the present, and the future. And normally one doesn't always think about the future in relation to heritage, but it is actually a central idea, has always been a central idea of heritage from, from yeah. the beginning. Because it's always motivated that we need to preserve the remains of the past for the benefits of future generations. Yeah. So there's this intention that it adds something important to the lives of, of future generations. And that creates a responsibility today. That we can't just bulldoze um, all this stuff, but we need to take care and study it and preserve uh, as much as possible. Yeah. So that's the link why, why the future is, um, has always been very central in the heritage sector. But now, I mean, when we talk about it that way, it becomes a little bit about its buildings, its structures, but mm -hmm. you've been working with nuclear waste. That is not something you necessarily would consider <laughs> well, um, heritage, but it is something that we have with us. Well, I've written some work on... Oh, uh, on did we just go out of the park again? Uh, we can... Yep. Yeah, or we can just go... We can walk this way here. All right. Yeah. So, um, um, a colleague of mine, Anders Hülkberg, and I, we, we, we've argued that um, nuclear waste is actually a very specific uh, kind of heritage. Yeah. So it's a variety of, her of heritage, in the sense that it is a legacy of our age. Uh, just like other legacies, like the like the Middle Ages or the Renaissance or, or here um, uh, a park yeah. um, landscape. It's something that we inherit. And not all of the, uh, what we inherit is positive, is something to be proud of or something we want to enjoy in, in, in some way. Uh, in fact, much of the most interesting and maybe challenging parts of history are not so pleasant. Yeah. And, and they're still heritage. So heritage is, doesn't have to be pretty and uh, beautiful um, and so on, but it can also be challenging and uh, raising complicated questions, ethical questions and, and so on. So um, nuclear waste fits quite perfectly into this category. We try and draw conclusions about the past based on on the evidence that we find. Is there any limits to sort of the freedom that archaeologists have in in sort of making these uh, claims or ideas of yeah, I would like to offer you a third possibility there, um, because on the one hand you mentioned the role of the evidence, yeah. um, and there's a su substantial part of archaeology is a scientific, with a capital S, scientific uh, kind of archaeology, and they date things and they identify things and they do pollen analysis and bones yeah. and and there's a lot of evidence that they can gather and a lot of facts they can produce and and that's all valid as such and plays an important role. Um, and then on the on the other um, spectrum, other side of the spectrum is what you would call free speculation. That's sort of what you were maybe alluding to. And and um, people sometimes think that if it's not fact, well then it's speculation. Certainly, many of our students mm -hmm. think that. Um, so, which means you make up uh, make our ideas. Wh whatever you want, you know. And yeah. if you don't know, then it's ritual and um, or and religion and and, uh, and so on. And ultimately, nobody has a clue. Well, um, I come from a school where. <laughs> I was educated in, in a school that sort of lies in between that and 
um, that would say at the end of the day what matters is, 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 is neither the, the detailed uh, factual evidence nor the, the, the uh, free speculation but it's interpretation it's, it's the process of making sense of things and I think that's what we all do in our lives but that's what, what you're tra doing yeah. to me right now making sense of what I'm doing but that's also what the archaeologist does with the finds we, we're interpreting that in, in, from, from our position in our context we're asking a set of questions we have certain approaches interests and we're trying to make sense of that for our time. So ultimately it's not about what it, what it was really like in, at, at a different age. It's not about the past. It's always about the present. It's what it means to us. Why it is meaningful to us. And of course that changes as, uh, as we get older and as one generation replaces yeah. another. That's why the discipline is never complete. Mm. In, in, in the sciences normally you recognize that you're also affected by the present. But you, you call that bias. Yeah. You call that something you're not proud of. Something that you would rather do without if you could but you can't um, well I would say it's not bias it's it's not only inevitable but it's also what you want it's, it's also desirable because it means that the knowledge you create is relevant to your own context yeah. you know it's not just some 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 numbers and, and, and figures that you know ultimately don't mean anything and, and, and we're not talking here about physics or biochemistry uh, we're talking about people uh, and at different times how, how they lived mm -hmm. what, what they did and that we can't study in terms of figures and no. sort of uh, just 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 separated facts that don't belong into a certain context. So in order to make this relevant to us, we need to um, we need to come we need to uh, ask questions situated from from a context in, in in which we are today. And yes, it's not the context of the past. The way we understand the people who built this castle over there, it's not the same way in which they understood it or, or different people in, in different times who came to this place. But that doesn't matter because we want to make sense of it today for us. Yeah. It doesn't really need to be meaningful for people who lived in the 17th century. That's not our challenge. Then that brings us to, but how do we then preserve it? How? Yeah. Well, what do we preserve? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, and this is one of the big challenges. That's why um, uh, it's one of the aspects why we're working with, with uh, Heritage Futures. Because most people in the in the heritage sector, they sort of see a value in preservation yeah. as such that uh, it needs to be preserved because it is old, uh, and it's maybe something we um, we, f we find valuable um, today. But the, the the idea with heritage values is that you challenge the relationship between present and, and the future which means that you can't take it for granted. You can't assume that only because we enjoy it today and it maybe brings tourists here and it's yeah. beautiful and we like to take pictures and, and so on, doesn't mean people will do the same thing in the future. Like in 100 years from now, who will be at this castle? What will they do? Why will they think it's a good place or a bad place? And uh, how will it be used? These are not questions that, are, that can be answered by just saying they do the same thing as today. So whether or not we want to preserve it must depend on a judgment on how we see the future. And that has never been done before. No. And that's, that's what we think is the question one needs to address first. If we preserve something for future generations, then we need to know when are they living, who are they, who are these future generations, and what are their, their needs, and, yeah. or what would benefit them. And unless we have some idea of that, we don't need to preserve it, because we have it already today. For us, we don't need to preserve it. So, yeah. But how do you then determine how well, the future is looking? And, then, and normally when I present on this, I, I say there are two things we can know about the future. Um, one is that um, it's not like the present. So it's in, in, in negative terms. Uh, we should avoid presentism. So we should uh, just, what, what I said just now, we should um, avoid assuming that the future is like the present. So let's forget all the yeah. uh, baggage we yeah. carry. Um, so that's only, that's a precondition. But then yeah. what do we know positively about the future? And the other thing I say is that we know actually more about the future than one thinks. Um, now, not necessarily a hundred thousand years into the future. But, no, no. But that's not necessary for heritage. That's for nuclear waste. Um, but for example, if we think like 50 years into the future, so there are certain trends that um, more or less um, we know about. For example, climate change. Yeah. We don't know exactly how many no. degrees, no, uh, no. but we know it's getting warmer and it has consequences on, on, on various levels with the weather. And we see that, uh, in fact, this year. <laughs> 
all over the place Absolutely. already and yeah. that doesn't mean we can predict every single event but we know that it will have consequences people will not be able to continue with their subsistence patterns as they have done and they will need to change their ways of life and some of them will move and uh, have to find a, um, a living somewhere else so yeah. this creates issues social issues global issues that need to be addressed and heritage could be one way of dealing with that but that's a challenge that we know about I think one of the interesting things, and as if you mention impact on, on society, is yeah. that, that people take it so personal, heritage. Yeah. It's uh, like when a building is supposed to be demolished, there are huge campaigns uh, sometimes. Yeah. People sign lists uh, and so on. Because it's not just a building, it's, it also exemplifies um, part of the identity of, of, of their town and of yeah. their lives. People have memories of what happened outside this building or inside, and who, or who lived there uh, at some point uh, and so on. So ultimately, heritage always raises the question of who am I and, yeah. and where do I belong and, and also where I don't belong. Um, it's always this us and them. It's yeah. the, the people who are part of the history who are sort of... So is that where like, the future, um, either whether it's climate change or mobility or migration patterns, mm -hmm. uh, become a sort of discussion point? Because it because mm. us and them. Well, there, there should be. This is one of the questions we're, we're raising now. Because if we, and I think we can safely assume that, yeah, the other, I um, need to backtrack a little bit. Sorry, yeah. The, <laughs> the, um, except I mentioned earlier the trends of climate change that, yeah. that we see quite clearly. Yeah. And it has consequences that where heritage can be part, maybe, yeah. of the solution. But there are also other trends that we quite clearly see. And a lot of them are demographic. So if we think a few decades ahead, uh, 30, 40 years. And many of the people who will live at that time, they are still, they're already born, they're already here. So it is not speculation. We know their life expectancy and we know how many are born and we know uh, the, how many, or we have a good idea of how many will be born over the next, um, this follows quite regular yeah. curves in different parts of the world, of course, but, but still. So we, we know that uh, there's a maximum number of the population that we will see in, 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 in a few decades, but then it will probably stop to grow uh, along yeah. the same uh, trajectory. But we also know people will live in Asia predominantly, yeah. it's already visible, um, and they will live in cities, and they will live longer and are healthier. Um, so we're looking at a population that is older on average than now, um, and that's not uh, sorry, uh, that's older, uh, that is larger than today, that lives more in cities and mostly in Asia. So these are the people, the global population, um, we will have to work with. And so what role can heritage play in that? Um, well, that's the challenge where we really need to do more work. And also the authorities, uh, I think, who are responsible for heritage yeah. need to care. How do we address the needs of, the pe of, 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 of that sort of uh, global population? And now we're coming back to where you started um, yeah. just now. Because if we also think that there uh, will be the global mobility rate will not slow down, but will either stay the same or maybe even go up, which is not unlikely given that there will be more people and that the living standard is probably not going to go down drastically, but there will be, even in the future, new technologies that will allow us to um, fly even yeah. or travel in other ways that are climate neutral. So this no longer is an issue. Um, and there will be uh, quite strong push factors that mean that people can't stay where they are. For example, yeah. higher water levels or wars and conflicts or all sorts of... Um, we see that today as people are forced to leave where they yeah. come from. So we, if we assume that there will also be a constant um, uh, stream of people arriving in Sweden, for example, yeah. or in other places in, in Europe or in the world, mm. then we have to, to see they will live, for example, in this place and they will need to feel at home here and belong here too. We don't want to have a society where it's us and them, yeah. where we always have this division and some people feel at home and others not. And some people are respected and cared for in a different way than, than other people. And heritage can play an important role for that because it means you, you need to try to preserve buildings that have a message, an inclusive message, that is everybody's past, not mm. just people who've been here for 10 generations. Yeah. And this creates big challenges because it may mean it's a completely different set of, uh, of sites and buildings that 
that can have such a message. It's not yeah. necessarily the old ones that, that no. have that. Doesn't mean one should demolish everything, but one should ask this question: How do we accommodate these people's interests? What yeah. is the most important heritage for the future? And it doesn't have to be the same as it was in the past. It can be something completely different. Uh, yeah, but how do we keep up with that? How? Because <laughs> if the if we are right now, I mean, we start thinking about mm. heritage futures. Mm. But yet, heritage is what we have with us right now. Mm. How can we step out of that box and say, well, right now it's not the pretty castle behind us that's mm. our heritage that we need to preserve. It's well, that's of course why that's a, it's not easy, and that's why we need to. That's why we're asking these questions, and we say what we need to develop is is is, is a futures literacy. We need to learn how to uh, ask and and address that question and the first thing we need to understand is that what we take for granted today is not necessarily what future generations yeah. will uh, what will benefit them most what uh, what we should maybe take for granted with the future in mind um, so I think we would achieve a lot by already not take for granted that um, what was valuable in the past and maybe today is necessarily what we need to preserve for the future I think that will be our last word. Okay. Because it's getting a little nippy and yeah. cold <laughs> standing here. It does. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.